Alfie Steele was a lovely boy whose family described him as charming and funny. They said his unique personality made him a treasure to be around and he could make you cry laughing with his quirky dances and comical phrases. Like many young boys, he was sports mad and loved watching his team play on TV. However, behind closed doors, Alfie was subjected to unimaginable cruelty at the hands of his mother, Carla Scott, and her boyfriend, Dirk Howell. This is an extremely upsetting, heartbreaking case where a selfish mother not only abused her son, but also stood by and let her boyfriend essentially torture and assault her child over a period of 18 months, leading to his death at just nine years old. This is the heartbreaking case of Alfie Steele. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's case is one that I followed in the press. It's one that a lot of you have asked for. I'm aware it's child death. I'm equally aware that this is one of those cases that we need to give legacy to. I make no apologies for doing that. You all know that as somebody who worked in child safeguarding for a very long time, and as somebody who is still committed to the safeguarding of children, these cases lay heavy on my mind and ensuring that Alfie is remembered rightfully and that the predators who killed him are also remembered for their actions is deeply important to me. If you're new to this channel and you've just stumbled across me, my name's Emma Kenny and I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, always deep dime crime. And that means that if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Let's get on with today's case. Alfie. How would we describe him? Well, he was said to be incredibly charming, very funny, intelligent, but a really inquisitive and curious boy. I think that children have that particular predisposition to be interested and excited by everything. And Alfie personified that. He had a real kindness to his nature, a real cheeky smile. He was a gorgeous looking little boy. People said that the smile itself was enough to just melt your heart. And the neighbours who knew Alfie said, look, he was one of those kids that was just always really chatty, but incredibly polite. So he had that etiquette around him that made him stand out. Also, he was seen to be a really caring little boy. These are all direct quotes. They also said he was brave. He liked to explore. It feels like I'm describing a child who sees the world as an adventure playground and is really intrigued and excited by that. Now, Alfie's mother and her boyfriend, we are gonna to cover today the sadism, as far as I'm concerned, the regime of punishment that will be recognized in the press and in the courts as being noted as a campaign of abuse. He was somebody who excruciatingly went through agonies that very few of us can even begin to consider happening to a child. We're going to talk about the fact that he was beaten and whipped with belts and shoes. He was locked outside. He was even held under water in cold baths. He was deprived of food. They'd have him standing outside in the middle of the night to have cold water thrown over him. And this was something that was common in this child's actual abuse and eventual murder, essentially. But we'll cover that later on. Let's look at Carla Scott, Alfie's mother. So she moved from Wolverhampton, let me tell you. When she was living in Wolverhampton, she was basically a notorious figure. She came from a very working class estate and she moved to a council house in Worcestershire. Now it's here that she gives birth to Alfie and she actually gives birth to Alfie on the living room floor. So clearly that would have been a relatively fast labor and Alfie arrives in the world this way. Now a former neighbor said that from the get-go, this woman 
was more interested in herself than anybody else and more interested in her own needs and wants than she was ever concerned about regarding her children. So she would put anything in front of her kid because at the end of the day, all that mattered were her selfish needs. It's also noted that she was somebody who liked to dress very provocatively. She seemed to enjoy to crave attention. And I would note that even though that's noted in documents in the press, we also can't just judge a woman because she wants to dress provocatively. It's up to you to wear whatever you want. And sometimes it can mean that you're more, shall we say, suggestive within your nature and you enjoy that attention. Sometimes it's just about fashion. Sometimes it's about culture. And you just have to go on Instagram and see the kind of things that people wear. And I just worry when we start judging women because of the fact that they dress a certain way. However, she also had a penchant, shall we say, for removing clothes, enjoyed games of strip poker. How very 1980s, that's all I can say. But again, the very fact that she's comfortable with playing those kind of sexualized games, that does kind of suggest that she's more open to, shall we say, liberal sexual behavior. Also, a former best friend of hers said that Carla was quite needy. She always went out with different boys. So she's looking for that sense of reinforcement. That could indicate that she has levels of lower self-esteem. It could indicate that she's incredibly confident body-wise and sexually. Either way, it also suggests that she has, shall we say, a bit of a fixation with being validated by men. Also, her home. What can we say about that? Well, I would say it was an utterly filthy tip probably the best way of describing it. Now she splits up with Alfie's biological father. He's apparently violent and that happened in 2017. And of course it's really good if she's been in a horribly violent relationship and she decides to leave that. That's both positive for her and it's positive for Alfie as well. So we've got to acknowledge her behavior in that moment because she's being protective of both her own needs and of her child. Now Carla Scott, was also known to social services because of the way that she was in relationships. She was seen as a really vulnerable person. And when she meets Howell, she actually gets engaged to him within six months of meeting him in 2019. Now, again, we all understand intensity in relationships. The psychological feeling of falling in love is incredibly alluring. And this can mean that we act in a more impulsive way. Some would say reckless, but it's not unusual. One of the reasons there is a term lovesick is because literally it happens. You genuinely suffer some kind of blindness and sickness that makes you feel like the world is a wonderful place. And for a period of time, you are floating on air. Obviously, for the most part, we all come crashing down to reality, you know, two years in when you're wandering around thinking, how do they still think the floor is the wardrobe? That's the kind of thing that most of us go through. So I'm not gonna be negative about the fact that she gets engaged to how within six months, it's quite a common scenario. But again, it does say something about maybe a lack of prioritizing a child because what you want to make sure of is that this individual behaves in an appropriate manner around your kids is somebody who's going to be safe around your kids and also is someone that if they come into your life on a more permanent basis they're going to stay that's why it's difficult when you have a child to navigate and balance those difficult feelings because you are having all of these wonderful experiences falling in love, but equally you need to prioritize your kid or your kids because that's how you are protective and those protective mechanisms should play out. Now, it's also worth noting, again, with respect to her, that she actually makes a request about Howell under Claire's law. That's through the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme. That is incredibly important because it shows that she's taking some responsibility. She wants to know, is this a violent person that I am actually spending time with? So for those of you who are not in the UK, Claire's law is a law that was passed with a legacy for a victim who was killed in a domestically violent situation. And it led to the lobbying and therefore the change in law so that if you do have a fear that your new partner could have a violent background, 
you can actually ask for that to be noted. They look on the registry if that's the case. And if you have an individual who has been convicted or has been noted as being violent in a relationship, you'll be given that information. And the fact that she's doing that, brilliant, because we want to make sure that she's not inviting somebody violent into her life. Now, when that disclosure occurred, there was no relevant information about him, which is a shame, because when I describe Dirk Howell, it is almost uncanny, and I mean uncanny, that he is not on this register, because this guy is a horrible, Sorry, that's not a very psychological term, is it? This man is horrible, but it's a very appropriate one. So Dirk Howell, he meets Scott in 2019, starts the relationship. Apparently he asked for her number when he saw her. He was working as a tree surgeon and obviously she caught his eye and he just elects to ask for the number. Now, what would we say about his opinion towards authority? Well, he doesn't like them. He doesn't like any services. He doesn't like the police. He certainly doesn't like the social services and social care. And he's an individual who's very negative towards those organisations. And it isn't surprising because he spent an estimated 22 years, this is correct, 22 years in prison by the time he's 41. That's right. More than half his life in prison. We're really early age and that's just going to tell you immediately this is not somebody who acknowledges consequences addresses behavior takes accountability and responsibility and moves on this is somebody who is a repeat cycle offender so he ain't learning anything but what he does have is this real disdain for the services who he kind of blames no doubt for the way that he's ended up when he was in foster care, I will note that he actually started to get involved with crimes and criminal activity with one of his foster carers, which is absolutely appalling. How is it possible that we can take vulnerable children who are growing up in care, who already have to struggle with the realities of not having that secure foundation, and they end up with a criminal who actually teaches them how to go and do home invasions, for example? That is so wrong it's pretty astonishing so we see that he's been educated early to get involved in these malevolent realities and that's not his fault he should have been placed with foster carers who are actually law-abiding and caring and it's just disgusting that this hasn't happened but you can only blame that for a certain period of time in your life you can always say well that was completely unfair that should never have happened. I can't take full responsibility for it because I wanted to be in this foster caring situation where I was looked after. And the reality is they brought me into the criminal world. We can completely empathize with that. But then it stops when you get to be an adult. It's like, make better choices, sweetheart. So he ends up with 32 convictions for 95 offenses. That's right, 95 offenses. Yeah, he's only convicted of 32. But that's a huge amount. And that's between the years of 1994 and 2021. So this is before, of course, he gets convicted of the case that we're going to look at today. And those crimes were far reaching. So they included things like battery, theft, criminal damage, public order offences. There were 11 offences that were directly related to drugs and he was also sentenced to 22 months in prison for conspiracy to supply heroin and crack cocaine in 2017. So all the way up to meeting Alpha's mother, he's involved in criminal activity. This is not the type of human being that you want within, I don't know, 27 miles of a child. And if you put it into context, if you meet somebody and you're talking about who they are, you're finding out what they've done, and they're coming out with, well, basically most of my life I've been in prison. For my entire adult life I've been in prison. And by the way, part of that is to be involved with violent crime and also just, you know, supplying drugs that will kill people. You're not gonna be like, oh, you sound perfect. This is what I was looking for on my Tinder profile. I have swiped right, would you like the keys to my home? But clearly, she didn't get the memo on this. The chain of events that lead to Alpha's death are going to upset you. 
because usually we look at lots of missed opportunities and we also talk about people not being willing to offend but I think that to some degree people were willing to offend in this case they were willing to contact services they were willing to risk that kind of conflict and also to some degree there was some service involvement although absolutely not enough by any stretch of the imagination. Let's go back to August of 27, 2019. Alfie is witnessed screaming in the garden and there is a neighbour who was so disturbed by this, they actually ended up recording Alfie screaming. And I think that one, that's incredibly powerful. The neighbour wants to record it. They want to be able to say this has happened. They're obviously deeply moved by how horrific it sounds. They're really concerned about this little boy and they want to know that they can prove it. Apparently he's pleading, let me in. They didn't let him in for at least half an hour after that situation was unfolding. And then Howell basically shoves him onto the ground and then lets him back inside. But that's incredibly violent. Now the neighbor who I think is pretty extraordinary and also brilliant, they don't leave it. They complain to the council and they say, Things are going on here and they also think that there's drug dealing activity at the home which is obviously completely in context which we've just talked about regarding his crimes so Alfie is obviously in deep distress during this episode terrified and also we've seen a violent altercation take place please remove him immediately from the care of these individuals if you see somebody push a child to the ground that is a high level of violence. We have to remember, as an adult, you're like a giant to a kid. It's as simple as that. We get to September 2019. Howell actually needs to be assessed at this point by social services. And when they assess him, understandably, they think he's not the kind of guy that should be around Alfie unsupervised. And they say he's not somebody we want to be left alone around this child. And they make these absolute conditions where he can't be with Alfie unsupervised, he can't stay at the house overnight, he's got to be 100% guarded essentially because they know that if he is left with this child potential harm could arrive. Now these what would be said as precautionary rules because they were investigating what was going on at the time, they regularly broken by Howell and Scott. And what's really sad is that even though these precautionary measures occur, they never actually end up formally assessing Howell. And to me, what we do see noted here is that it demonstrates Scott isn't concerned at all about Alfie because she lets Howell stay over. She lets him have access to her son without any supervision. So she isn't concerned about the potential impact on this little boy. Bear in mind, if you are a parent and social services say to you, there is no way you need to have this man around your child by himself. We don't think he's safe. Don't have him stay overnight. And then you break those rules. It means that first of all, you haven't listened to the professionals who are paid and employed to protect your kid. And secondly, you prioritize your needs and your partner's needs over that of your child. And that means there is no safeguarding for Alfie at this moment in time. She essentially enables the abuse. And I think that's what I would say she is massively guilty of throughout this case. That the abuse is playing out in front of her eyes and she literally chooses not to see it or she enables it, she allows it. She has so little concern about the psychological, the environmental and of course the physical impact on her child. We get to October 2019. Now, at this point, the family have actually been placed on a child in need plan. And this ends up getting escalated in the October to a non-voluntary child protection plan. Now, this is a more serious level. So obviously, they're getting more and more concerned about this little boy. Then we get to March the 2nd, 2020. And again, what do we find? Witnesses seeing Howell treating Alfie abominably. So he's seen publicly, so in an area where there are lots of witnesses, screaming at Alfie. This is outside Drutwich Spa Health Centre. He's 
basically pointing in a stabbing motion in Alfie's face. And what is really alarming for the witnesses who see this playing out in real time is Alfie's demeanor and reaction. He's apparently frozen in fear. And even though Scott becomes present as this plays out, she just lets it go over her head. She ignores the interaction completely. She walks past them when she arrives. So that indicates that automatically we know that she's already used to Howell speaking to Alfie in this way. This is nothing new because it doesn't even affect her. She didn't seem shocked. She didn't seem appalled. And you have to ask yourself immediately, what kind of mother would do that? Genuinely, if I walked into a scene or situation, even now, and my boys are older. My boys actually can defend themselves. But if I were to walk in and see my partner screaming at them in public, pointing at them in an aggressive way, well, let's say an ambulance may need to be called and it wouldn't be for me and it wouldn't be for my sons. And I'm sure that most of us feel that way because essentially, connects with that visceral cerebral experience of being a parent where you just want to protect your child and she has absolutely none of those feelings by the way i'm not advocating violence or suggesting that you should put your partner in a situation where they require an ambulance and it's just being sarcastic <laughs> anyway you know what i'm saying the rage that one of us would feel if we had that kind of interaction and automatically what you'd expect to happen is that she'd walk in, see that Alfie is being abused in this way and get really angry with the man who she's invited into both of their lives, but not at all. Now, fortunately, a teaching assistant actually sees this happening and reports it to Alfie's school. She was devastated when she saw it because she felt if this man is behaving like this in public, what the hell is happening behind closed doors? And police also receive a report about this incident. So this has really been a notable reality that people who've actually witnessed this incident playing out, they know this is something high level. This is something dangerous. This is something that means this child could come to serious harm. You know, a police report is made and a school is informed. And I love the fact that these individuals have chosen to make those decisions because although we're not gonna be able to give this story a happy ending, it is possible because of people like that, that happy endings do happen. And that's why it's so powerfully important for us to risk offending because if you can save a life, if you can protect a child, it's worth absolutely doing that. Now the police actually turn up and they confront Howell about it at the shopping center, but he basically says he did nothing wrong and then gives them a fake name. Is it just me who thinks that should not be possible? I'm just gonna throw it out there. Surely if you give a fake name to the police, you are essentially breaking the law because they have a right to inquire about a potential abuse that's played out and that people have witnessed. But yeah, his response is he's done nothing wrong, gives them a fake name and off he goes, which feels like a massive failure as far as I'm concerned. Now we get to March 2020. At this point, there are legal discussions taking place because they're concerned about Alfie and they're concerned about whether he should be removed from his home because they believe that there is a potential abusive situation playing out. Now, I have no idea why the threshold for removal wasn't actually satisfied because I think the things that I've just covered should give us enough warning signs to say this is not acceptable. You know, this man has been told to stay away from this child. He hasn't. This man has been seen abusing this child on several occasions. And also the history of this man is dangerous. So for me to remove him even temporarily would seem like a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Bear in mind, he's eight years of age at this moment in time. So this is a child who cannot protect themselves. But apparently the main reason for not meeting that threshold was because scott was being considered to actually work with social services even though she wasn't because she was doing the opposite of what they were asking now this is as far as i'm concerned the biggest missed opportunity to save alfie because it's literally only 11 months after this discussion that he loses his life and of course that's the final event that doesn't include all of the horrifically cruel treatment that leads up to his death 
all of this could potentially have been prevented. Now we get to April 2020. A neighbour again sees that Alfie is outside in just his underwear. It's a really cold day. But there are so many levels to this kind of abuse. Putting a child outside, locking them out of the home is very abusive. I know that some parents will say, well, when they get into a terrible mood or when they need punishing, that actually exiting them from the property is a way of teaching them a lesson. It is very abandoning. It is highly isolating. It is incredibly terrifying for a child because they do not know how to regulate those situations. They do not know what it means. Will I ever get in again? These are very common feelings that children experience. They feel absolute horror in these scenarios add to that he's in his underwear so it's about humiliation it's about making him feel exposed and then on top of this it's cold so this is dangerous for him you should not have a child outside in their underwear on a cold day They also witness him mopping the floor about 4.30 a.m. in the morning. That's right, 4.30 a.m. So this is a form of torture, isn't it? A child of his age should not be up at this point. And this is really disturbing. They report it to social services because they are a good human being. And again, why is no one rushing in at this moment in time to protect that child, to withdraw that child from that situation? Then we get to April the 4th, 2020, a next door neighbor can actually hear banging and crashing. And then they hear a child whimpering. And they are so concerned about this, they actually call the police at 5.30 a.m. to report this. So again, we're talking about early hours of the morning. What on earth is going on behind those closed doors? And this neighbor actually said it sounded like a child in distress, crying, pleading almost. And I have no idea how adults can listen to the pleading of a child, the distress of a child, and not immediately try to soothe that situation. Because I think that as a parent, most of us have seen situations play out where a child's in great distress and they're just begging for things to change, begging for things to stop. I've witnessed it myself. I've dealt with parents with children who've gone through those situations and it plays in such a powerful way on your heartstrings that you just wanna run in and protect them. You wanna stop them having to go through that. But again, what we have are heroic neighbors who are actually making the calls. How often do I on this channel cover cases where people hear all of this stuff and do nothing? That's not what we're talking about. When we're thinking about missed opportunities, there are just so many, it's heartbreaking. On April the 5th, 2020, the police end up getting called because, again, there were these general concerns, in fact, about Howell and Scott. So obviously their relationship is tumultuous and neighbours are also concerned about what might be playing out there. And that's a high bar, isn't it? When your neighbours are actually that concerned about your relationship, they're calling the authorities. That means that this must be a consistent theme and also there are different levels to that theme. So on certain days their arguing will be something that the neighbors think might be bad but are not critical and on others they feel so moved that they need to literally speak to the police then we get to april the 10th 2020. at this point howell's seen screaming at alfie outside a sainsbury's store and people who witnessed it said it was just terror on that little boy's face and apparently Alfie was looking absolutely terrified. And people even overheard Howell saying that Alfie was going to catch COVID and die. And 
for those of you who've kind of put the whole pandemic behind you and don't want to even think about that, at this moment in time that we're talking about, this is where that fear porn was being pumped into everybody's home. You're going to kill granny, you're going to die, your whole family might die. It was a constant pumping of the fear narrative. And as a child, you absolutely believe what you see on TV. So for him to push this narrative towards Alfie and say, listen, you're going to get COVID and you're going to die, that is absolute psychological abuse and something that Hal is clearly perfectly at peace doing. And a lady actually sees this and confronts Howell, but then he basically turns on her because he's a violent, aggressive piece of S. And she then goes and asks the shop assistant to call the police. But Scott, obviously, at that point, is just wanting to, shall we say, reduce the escalation because Scott has seen that this is playing out and it's not going to end well for Howell. So she comes out of the supermarket and then says to this woman, oh, babe, just leave it, come on, in a whiny voice, then walks off after this. So essentially the police never came. But the witness described what they saw as really distressing and said that Hal was a vile bully, but also said that in spite of the fact that he's clearly a vile bully and has no problem turning on her for challenging him, that Scott, as a partner, didn't seem scared of him at all. And also didn't seem concerned about the actions towards her child. And again, this is blindsiding because this man has literally made your child feel like they may die. And you're okay with that? Could these two be any more wastes of spaces if they tried? If there was a guidebook on how to be a human with no worth in our society, would they be the author? Probably not. They probably wouldn't have a level of literacy that would allow them to do that. But maybe they would be featured within it as individuals, the evidence being a waste of space. Now, after mentioning the incident to a friend, the woman who actually saw this then felt encouraged enough to go and speak to the police. And I think, again, that's really powerful because she obviously has had that sit with her the whole time. She's been really worried about this child. She's spoken to a friend and that person's validated and reinforced. Listen, you need to do something about that. And a friend even went so far as to say, if you don't do something and then something terrible happens, you will never forgive yourself. So again, that's something that notes it was a high level aggressive thing that played out because there's no way that you would be having those conversations unless it felt so left field. And she ends up giving a statement to the police and she was able to identify Howell from CCTV. Then we get to May the 4th, 2020. Alf is locked outside again in his boxer shorts. So this is a repeated pattern of abusive behaviour. At this point, another concerned neighbour, so not the one who'd originally called the police about this, another concerned neighbour calls the police and is really worried about what is playing out. So they are getting repeated reports about this family, about the relationship between the adults, but also about this consistent theme of abuse. Is it just me? Or should the police not be there every single time this plays out? This is deeply, deeply distressing for the child, for the people seeing it, because it is not normal in any way, shape or form. We get to August the 3rd, 2020. Another neighbour calls 999. Why? Because they can hear thrashing noises next door. And they actually said, quote, it sounds like my neighbours are doing something bad to their kid in the bath like they're really hurting them. Police emergency. Hello, it sounds like my neighbours are doing something bad to their kid in the bath, like they're really hurting them. Okay, what's the address? Okay. Right, so do you know what their names are? The woman's called Carla. And the guy's called Dean. Yes. So the female is Carla and the mm. bloke is who? Um, I think it's called Dean. Okay, so how long has this been going on for today? I've just heard some noise over the last oh, 15 minutes. Um, I heard lots of banging and it sounded like someone flashing around in a bathtub went into the toilet and it sounds like you can hear this guy.
he said that he's being hit and held under the water or something and like loads of thrashing around. It's concerning because I know they've got social services involvement as well and the police have been before a few times. Could you wait, make out what was being said at all? It sounded, um, no, I couldn't. I could hear like um, swear words. I could hear fucking something and something and it just sounded threatening and unpleasant but I couldn't make out words. I could just make out the tone and the you know what I mean? Yeah. So the police are called again because Scott actually goes round to the neighbour's house and she's really angry that the neighbour had called the police. So her results when the police turn up to question her about the safety of her child is not to consider the safety of that child. It's not to protect her child. It's to actually go round to the neighbour to have a go at them. Now the neighbour knows that this is what's going to be playing out so they don't actually answer the door because they don't want a confrontation with her. But on reflection when Scott's questioned about this apparently it was Howell's idea to confront the neighbours. Yeah? Sorry, are you remote control? Has he got a little box that he can use so that you just go and do whatever he asks? I mean, again, this is just deflection. Scott was more than comfortable to go around to confront the neighbours. It's certainly part of her M.O. Now, CCTV does show Howell telling Scott to tell the neighbours to mind your own fucking business. So, obviously, he does suggest that that's what he wants her to go and do. But Scott doesn't need to do it. And then as Howell actually leaves his property, he says, little dickheads, yeah see what happens now burn your house oh my god how are people like this walking our streets you know his response to this situation which is the right action they've heard a child in distress they think something terrible could have happened to this kid they've called the authorities to protect this child and his response is to send her around to have a go at them and then on top of that to suggest that he's going to burn the house down and believe me, this guy has form and potential, so that threat would likely be taken very seriously. We get to September 2020. At this point, Alfie begins attending a new school and they're really quickly concerned for him. There are lots of red flags for them. One of them is just he's got really poor hygiene. Secondly, he's always hungry. And pastoral support team as so many pastoral support teams do out there they notice all this and they want to kind of help him in a quiet way to live an easier life at school so they give him toast in the morning they make sure that he's at least had something to eat and this again suggests that they have deep concerns about his emotional psychological and physical well-being then we get to october 2020 at this point, Alfie is noted to complain about a pain in his ear. Also, he said that he'd had an accident in the night, so he'd either wet or soiled the bed. The school welfare lead at this point, you know, listens to what's being said and also notes that there's blood and pus inside his ear, which again is a sign of either an injury, an infection, or a serious problem that's going on within his ear. And let's be honest, we've all had earache. It's absolutely horrendous. I mean, it sends you up the wall. So the school then calls Scott to pick him up. But when they do that, this little boy becomes so upset. He's so scared at the idea of going home. Now that should and would ring alarm bells because let's be honest, we were all at school once and the idea of getting to go home was always a pleasure. Like literally, it would be my happy moment if I was seen as ill enough to be sent home. I don't know about you guys. I went to school in a different era. For those of you who are younger than me considerably, you probably won't realize how difficult it was to get sent home from school. You could have a concerted effort, sometimes like for hours in the day. You could be crying with a migraine of such intensity, you thought you were literally gonna die. And still, they would keep you in school. I have no idea why, but it just seemed to be the way things worked back then. But most of us would genuinely celebrate because we get to go home to mummy or daddy or both. And in this case, all he shows is absolute terror. 
Then we get to December 2020. Now the staff at this point are really conscious about the fact that things are clearly not good at home. He smells really strongly of urine, so they end up giving him a new uniform. Also, they give him a food package because they want him to at least be able to eat. And really sadly, because we're talking about a school who clearly are noting that there are issues and are very much trying to protect him and also make sure that he's nutritionally fed and that his clothes are appropriate. So, you know, they are caring. In spite of that work, this is all going to now go horribly wrong because that's going to be the last time he attends school because we've got the Christmas holidays and then, of course, we have the horrific lockdown in January 2021. Now, I do appreciate that in the UK, vulnerable children and key worker children, they were allowed to go to school still. If you were a vulnerable learner, it was noted that in spite of the apparent pandemic, you would need to be able to have access to education and food. But even though he could have accessed school as a vulnerable learner, he doesn't end up going back. We then get to February 18th, 2021. This is the fateful day. This is the last day of Alfie's life. Scott rings 999 at 2.24 p.m. Apparently, Alfie is unresponsive and not breathing. He said he'd fallen asleep in the bath and apparently banged his head as well. We've heard this kind of story before, haven't we? We know what's coming, but this idea that, oh, it's nothing to do with us. It's just one of those accidents. Just a child fell asleep in the bath after banging her head. In the 999 call she made, she said that Alfie was making lots of gargling noises. So she's indicating at that moment in time that he's still alive. Obviously something is really wrong, but clearly the fact that he's making gargling noises suggests that there are signs of life. Police and paramedics both attend because obviously the paramedics are there to try and save his life. The police will be there because it's highly unusual for somebody to call into emergency services and suggest that a child has potentially drowned in the bath or banged their head to a point or position where they may be actually declining life-wise. So on police body cam footage, Scott can actually be heard saying she found him about an hour ago. How long ago did you find him? An hour ago you found no, him? I, no, I went in there. Oh, yeah. And I, I got him out straight away. And I, I, sorry, you're not making much sense here. Sorry. Uh, sorry. It's all right, it's all right. When did you first come across him? About two, about ten minutes ago. About ten minutes ago, that's yeah. what I meant, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Okay, we, sorry. Okay, it's all right, my love, it's okay. I think he's back. Okay. He's got some... Okay, we'll go... Okay, do you want to... Right. Now, if you hear that, you're immediately going to be suspicious. What do you mean you found him about an hour ago and you think he's seriously injured or dying and you haven't got in contact with emergency services? But then she quickly changes the story and says that she came across him about 10 minutes ago. So again, the fact that she's changing her story is going to instantly make people suspicious. Now, one of the things that I think is just such an ironic reality in that body cam footage is that through it, you can actually see text on the wall that says family where life begins and love never ends. I mean, haunting words considering the horror of Alpha's home and family life. Maybe they had been put on by a loving family who used to live there. But what an irony, where life begins and love never ends, apart from it does because it didn't exist, because Alfie didn't get loved. I don't think that child knew love. I think that the only care he received were from people who were not his immediate mother and his immediate stepfather, shall we say. I think it existed elsewhere and it was devoid and lacking in every cell in those adults' bodies that child would have received absolutely no comfort, soothing or love or loyalty from those two people who were meant to wish to protect him. Now she calls Howell because she wants to know where he is. And this is because Howell is no longer at the property. So on that phone call, she actually says that Alfie has gone up to the hospital. Now, the truth is he had been there at the house when Alfie died. Of course he had, but legs it. 
runs away before the emergency services arrives. And Scott, of course, who at this moment in time should be absolutely hysterical. Where would you be if your child was dying in front of you? You would be in a blind panic, hysterical, guilt-ridden even because you don't understand what's happened or played out, that your child is in this situation and you don't know how to protect them. These are more normal reactions. But she somehow, within this awful panic and trauma that's playing out, manages to just lie to the police. So essentially acts as if he hadn't been present when Alfie had met this horrible situation and instead plays out, where are you? Alfie's being taken to the hospital. She has no concern or consideration about the reality of Alfie's condition. Of course, the paramedics desperately try to save him, but tragically when he gets to the hospital, they announce that he's dead, can't do anything. They find Howell, would you believe it, at Droitwich Station, trying to board a train. This is literally his reaction. And I know what you're thinking. Well, it's what anybody innocent would do. I mean, whenever I've done something that I'm completely not guilty of, my reaction is something as extreme as just thinking, I'll just escape from this scenario entirely, because that's what an innocent person does. As I have absolutely nothing to hide, I'm just going to go to a different locality and reinvent my whole life, said nobody who is innocent ever. And bear in mind, he's trying to board that train literally minutes after Alf has been declared dead. So what would his reaction be expected to be? Absolute horror, running to the hospital, trying to figure out what the hell happened, but no. For him, it's buying a ticket and trying to leave the area. Put your hands up for me. So, so at the moment, you're under arrest. When they arrest him, he says to the police that he hadn't done anything wrong. And I imagine that they were like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you haven't. That's why you're going on a train minutes after this child has died. That's why you're pretending that you weren't present at the scene of the crime, because you're so not guilty. Now, later, it's clear that Alfie's death was completely non-accidental. It was violence. It was brutal. And that Scott and Howard tried their best, shall we say. I mean, they hadn't done a very good job, but they tried their best to spin this web of lies. And far from this little boy going through this almost peaceful falling asleep in the bath scenario death that she described when it came down to the trial, all of these really harrowing details emerge. The trial begins on the 2nd of May 2023, so it's really recent. It lasted six weeks and the judge knew that the jury were going to be so unbelievably traumatised by the details that they heard and the images that they had to witness that they'd never have to sit on a jury again. That's how sickening the details of Alfie's death were, that the judge wanted to make it clear that the jury would be protected from ever sitting in a trial again. Now, Scott, of course, initially lies and says that Howell hadn't been home when she found Alfie. And this in itself, again, evidence what we talked about earlier on, which is that she chooses to prioritise people that she is intimately linked to rather than protect her own child. Because she wants, in spite of the fact that this man has been involved in the murder, maybe even the word execution, would be a more appropriate term to use. She knows this, and yet her reaction is to just try to make it so that he doesn't have to face the consequences. So she says, yeah, he wasn't home when Alfie was found. But then when it starts to hot up for her, and she's realizing that she's gonna be the culpable one because the injuries are gonna clearly demonstrate that somebody has horribly abused his child. At this point, she decides to change her story. She says, okay, he was there at the time. And she then says, the reason that I've suggested that he wasn't was because he told me to say that he wasn't there. And she said that she didn't want to get into trouble and she didn't want to get him into trouble because obviously in this situation, choosing to protect your murderous partner over your son, even when your son has been killed by him, is a priority. 
I mean, it's unthinkable, isn't it? As a mother, to imagine doing that. As a father, to imagine doing that. To protect somebody who has stolen the most priceless, priceless being from your life. And yet it's easy for her. Yeah, I'll save my relationship, not my child. Then she denies that she actually did that to protect Howell. So now she says, oh, actually, no, it wasn't to protect him at all because she's now going to probably play in the fact that she was just controlled and she's just a victim in all of this. I mean, she isn't. And it's unbelievable that you see this card get troped out in these scenarios. But that's where she's going to go with it. And the problem that she's got is that she's just not staying consistent with a story and that means that she's confusing herself with all her lies and that's not going to look good for her in any cross-examination situation. That's not going to look good for her full stop because when you are investigating these kind of crimes, even though you do expect new themes to come in, new memories to be provoked, what you do expect is a level of consistency within the main experience of the story and she's just failing miserably. Now Scott said that she realised Alfie was under the water in the bath. Then apparently she lifts him out with one arm under his head, another under his legs. Howell, who's now admitted that he was at the property, he said, well, when all this is happening, I was just listening to love reggae and playing Clash of the Clans in the bedroom. Honestly, I kid you not. I wonder how long it took him to think this kind of stuff up. I'm listening to love reggae, so very specific love reggae. Look, I'm a really peaceful, loving person listening to reggae. I'm just chilling, playing games in the bedroom. I'm having nothing to do with this horrible treatment of this child who's now been mortally wounded. And apparently at this point, whilst he's just chilling, you know, relaxing to the reggae, Scott runs in carrying Alfie. And at this point, of course, what does he do? Well, he becomes the hero. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? He becomes the hero before he just disappears from the scene altogether. Yeah, apparently he performs CPR on Alfie. But then, when it's not working, he admits he just fucked off and left because he didn't want to be around the situation. Quote, my head was a mess. I have never seen. I've seen a lot of things in my past, but I couldn't. Nah. I'm <laughs> sorry. One. That isn't even a paragraph that makes sense as a quote, with respect. But two, are you kidding me? That your response to a child being mortally wounded and dying is you can't handle seeing it, so you're just going to leave the environment entirely. Said no responsible human ever. You could have a child in the street literally wounded and members of the public who have no relationship to that child showing up and doing whatever they can to protect the child because well-adjusted human adults do that but then we're not talking about a well-adjusted adult in fact are we talking about a human adult I find it quite difficult to relate really don't really think he meets the benchmark for being a human let alone one who's well-adjusted Am I being a bit personal there? I am. I don't care. He's an absolute arsehole, isn't he? The idea that he's even suggesting that running away is acceptable is BS. It's the absolute most abnormal response to this. And especially abnormal if you are innocent. You don't need to run away. All you'd care about is finding out what the hell has happened to this child. Now, when they piece together what they believe happened to Alfie that day, the belief is that Howell repeatedly beat him in the bedroom and then took him and threw him into the bath with a, quote, sickening thud. Devastatingly, that little beautiful boy's final words were calling for his grandfather to help him. Can you imagine the agony for that grandfather? To know that, in one level, the comfort that in Alfie's most distressing, most horrific moment, all that little boy could think about was somebody who would genuinely protect him, and that's what he's doing. His grandfather obviously represents love and protection, warmth and care and nurture. But on the other hand, the devastation for the grandfather who couldn't be there, who no doubt would have moved heaven and earth to protect him. And to hold those words in his head now, to hold those final moments, knowing that when Alfie was desperate, 
he wasn't there to help him. Jurors were told that Scott and Howell then went on and tried to cover up the murder. They delayed calling 999. They actually believed that they took Alfie from the bath at one point, but then put him back in the bath because they wanted to disguise it as an accidental drowning, which is just stupid because obviously a pathologist is going to be able to identify the cause of death, but they aren't exactly the sharpest tools in the box, are they? When the paramedics actually arrived, Alfie was already cold to touch. Now, bear in mind, the police arrived six minutes after the 999 call, and at this point, his temperature was just 23 degrees Celsius. This means that he'd been dead for some time before the arrival of emergency services which again corroborates the fact that they delayed calling them. Now, of course, the prosecution have got a really strong case, but the defence are going to have to argue something. So the way that they do it is to say, yeah, well, this is awful and Alfie did die, but we believe that he had a seizure in the bath. Oh, sorry, what? Yes, we believe, go with me on this, that Alfie was in the bath, had a seizure. Alfie doesn't suffer from seizures. I know. I know that's true, physiologically. But what we're saying is that during this particular bath, he did suffer from a seizure. You're just making this up, aren't you? We are just making this up. We have literally nothing to offer apart from two very evil individuals. We just, we're clutching at straws. We're clutching at nonsensical, non-physiologically based straws. That's, that's it, that's all we've got. But yeah, apparently had this seizure in the bath, but experts said there is no epilepsy in this. There's no relevant factor to be introduced as new evidence in this case that could identify why this apparent seizure had happened. There's no previous reality to this kind of diagnosis. So it just makes no sense whatsoever. When the pathologist looked at how Alfie actually died, they said he either died from drowning, concussive head trauma, or mechanical asphyxia. So they can't specify which of those three things ultimately killed him, but obviously they all coexisted injury-wise. So the experts said it was likely that Alfie was hit on the head. That would have disrupted his heart rhythm. That could have caused his heart to stop, or it could have also left him unconscious, which would have led him to drowning. But the extent of his injuries was enormous. He had over 50 injuries, and they were mostly non-accidental injuries, from blunt force trauma. The bruises suggested that he'd been kicked, he'd been manhandled. He also devastatingly had defensive injuries. So this little boy put up a fight for his life. It's incomprehensible to me how a nine-year-old little boy would find himself covered in defensive injuries. It's just testament to a horrible, horrible life. No child should have to defend themselves against violence in a home. No child should ever be a victim of this kind of abuse. And the horror that this little body, this little boy, would have absolutely no chance whatsoever compared to a bully and a sadist like Howell. It's devastating to even conceive of. When he died, he weighed only 27 kilograms. That is unbelievably frail and that adds even more horror to those defensive injuries because he wouldn't have stood a chance. Mr Justice Wall, who was presiding over the case, said that both Scott and Howell refused to tell the truth about Alpha's death, preferring to lie, to pretend it was no more than an accident that was just a tragedy that they had no control over and then of course to cover up for one another. He said that February 18th was just another day that they'd gone ahead and decided to torture Alfie, that they were complicit in that torture, that they were happy with that torture. Also, the judge commented that he was sure Howell took pleasure from inflicting pain. The judge said that both of them played an active part in all the forms of the cruelty inflicted. And he said of Scott in particular, it is revealing 
that you have chosen to maintain your relationship with Howell after he killed your son. It is a sure sign that you approved of his actions. You are a woman who put your need for male companionship above your duty to protect Alfie. Judge also said he'd seen Scott acting sympathetically towards Howell during the trial. Can you imagine how disconcerting that would be to witness? Because for the most part, if your child's killer was in the same room as you, I think you would need to be shackled to prevent yourself from doing the harm that you would wish them, that you would be carrying in your heart, in your mind, the agony that you'd want to inflict on them for stealing the life of your baby, but not her. She just maintains that level of connection with this brutal bastard who's horrifically murdered her little boy. We get to June the 13th and 15th, 2023. That's when the verdicts and sentences occur. Howell is found guilty, of course he is, of murdering Alfie. He gets sentenced to life. He gets a minimum term of 32 years, which is a lengthy sentence in the UK. But let me say it now, I don't want this kind of individual ever allowed to be back on our streets. I mean, he has comfortably spent most of his life in prison anyway. Just let's keep him there. You don't have a right to your freedom when you've stolen the freedom and future of this little boy. Scott, well, she gets convicted of manslaughter, but she gets a high sentence for manslaughter. She gets 27 years. She does get cleared of murder. I guess that that's because they felt that the most compelling evidence was Howell. But with respect, I think she was absolutely complicit in the murder. I think she should have been found guilty of murder. I appreciate I'm not part of the jury. I appreciate that I can only speculate, but just the bare bones of what we've talked about. She is somebody who colluded with this killer and she is somebody who also tried to extricate him from potential prosecution by saying he wasn't even present. So she's not just somebody who was a willing participant in the torture and killing of this child. She's a willing participant in trying to prevent the actual killer getting into trouble for this murder. Now, even though she's got 27 years, she will only serve at least 17 years in jail. It's not long enough as far as I'm concerned. And it's unbelievable that both of them denied unlawful killing. It's just insane. Like every bit of evidence, both pre the killing, you know, from all the witness testimony, the school, etc., all of this adds up to the reality that they have done it without a doubt. But they're not gonna admit it. Now, Scott also gets found guilty of child cruelty and Howell did actually admit child cruelty. And when Scott was actually led away from court, a member of the public shouted, evil swine. I tell you what, that person's got a lot more self-control than me. Swine, not being funny, but pigs are the most fourth sentient beings in the universe. At the end of the day, she ain't up there with the intelligence of any pig. Just throwing it out there. I can think of more fitting, shall we say insults, that could be construed in such a moment. I have a list. If anybody requires that list, should they be going to see any trials like this, please feel free to email me and I will share them with you. They are vile insults because people like this deserve such vile insults. In fact, I wouldn't even say they would be an insult. They would be a description of the kind of human being that they were. Now, when she's led away, Scott starts to cry before she's taken down to the cells. Oh, boo-hoo, how awful. But again, the only emotion that she had during the trial that caused that crying was when she found out how long she was going to be in prison. I mean, she should have been an emotional wreck throughout the entire trial. But no, just when she finds out that she's lost her freedom. Unbelievable. And yet to be expected with this kind of individual. Now, Detective Chief Inspector Leighton Harding said, it's unimaginable to consider the fear and distress that Alfie must have felt. At no stage have Scott nor Howell shown any remorse or acceptance of responsibility. That evidence is why neither of them should walk our streets again. Because even in the face of their guilt, even with the wealth of information, forensics, 
the identification by the pathologist of their guilt they take no accountability and responsibility and if you do not take accountability if you do not take responsibility you do not change now whilst without a doubt howell is the main antagonist in this particular story and he is the most guilty for what happened to that child although like i said i put her as an equally culpable individual in this situation there are actually accounts that suggest that Alpha's neglect had began even before Scott met Howell. So there is a former neighbour of Scott's from Wolverhampton, Julia Peacock, and she said there were a group of us on the estate who just felt sorry about how neglected he always was. We used to take him in, we used to give him meals. He was really thin. He was always starving hungry. And a former friend said she didn't think that Scott was interested in being a mum at all also said that social services were actually involved with Scott before she was moved to Worcestershire. So these accounts all suggest that Scott didn't care about Alfie at all. She only cared about her own needs. Her well-being was far more important than his. And yes, Howell added to that horrible distress for this little boy, but it's not like she turned from some doting mother to a monster under his influence. And it just seems as if Alfie was always this neglected, abandoned, hungry little boy. You know, he was just somebody who was rejected by her. He never experienced the motherly care that he needed, the motherly care that he 100% deserves. Now, I haven't been able to find prior reports of physical abuse from Scott before Howell, so I want that noted as well. But I think the testimony from neighbours who knew him and knew her very, very powerful descriptors of the experience that he went through. And let's not forget Alfie's granddad, because Alfie's granddad has suffered. He says that he can no longer sleep because he has thoughts of Alfie screaming for him to save him. He feels like he let down his precious grandson. And since hearing of Alfie's death, he says it's felt like a nightmare. I was so close to Alfie. I remember all the things he loved he used to make me smile. I was so proud of him. And he has to carry that day in, day out. The knowledge that in Alpha's most desperate moments, he wasn't present. In Alpha's most distressed of times, he couldn't protect him. The trauma that he will have to live with day in, day out for the rest of his life. Now, after this tragedy unfolded and became public knowledge, a neighbour actually came up with the idea of putting pictures of blue teddies up in the windows in memory of Alfie. So there are blue teddies that were seen in the windows in Vashon Drive, which is where Alfie lived. And that symbolism is really powerful, isn't it? That neighbours who probably didn't really know the family and probably didn't really know Alfie still feel that need for legacy for him, that his life had meaning. Yes, his life was eradicated, it was stolen, but that doesn't mean that he's not remembered. He'll always be remembered. When you look at whether Alfie's death was avoidable, because we always do, these cases are so important to analyse because of that. My God, there were so many missed opportunities to prevent him from suffering, to prevent him from eventually dying. I mean, the family were known to the police, they were known to social services. There had been all of the 999 calls from a absolute plethora of concerned neighbours. There'd been reports to Alfie's school, to social services. Neighbours even went to the housing association because they were so concerned about the family. But nothing was done. Nothing. The neighbours who actually reported the evil couple said that even from their standpoint, Alfie's death was entirely avoidable. And they condemned the authorities. They said, we reported the incidents to you and you did nothing. One of the neighbours actually called for a public inquiry. They said, the house was always shut up, the windows were closed, the curtains were drawn and all you can think about is what was going on behind them. Another neighbour said that social services are going to have a lot of questions to answer because they had been informed of the maltreatment of this little child. An NSPCC spokesperson they said that it's absolutely vital that a thorough review establishes whether more could have been done to protect this little boy because such findings can help prevent future tragedies. Although we all know that the amount of times I have to say lessons will be learned on this channel is devastating because if lessons are learned, 
these tragedies don't happen again. But these tragedies are happening again and again and again. And through lockdown, these tragedies escalated. So we contributed to those child deaths through those measures. Understandably, since Alfie's death has occurred, since his murder has been acknowledged, a multi-agency safeguarding review is underway. I haven't got the details of that as yet, but nonetheless, I will imagine the same advice and guidance will be given, that failures occurred, that lessons will be learned, and that Alfie Steele's life will not be lost without change. But we all know, so far, that change doesn't seem to have occurred, and I will not hold my breath to believe that this death will subsequently make any further differences. It feels like we have to completely change our approach to child safety in the UK, and that we have to revisit the whole environment and area of safeguarding, which is sadly lacking so many children who deserve the care, attention, stability and safety that these services should be able to offer. I'd love to know your thoughts. I think that the sentencing at least gives us some level of justice, but to imagine that little boy regularly in his underpants in the cold, locked out of home, distressed, screaming for help, to imagine that he suffered and endured these kind of experiences on a daily level, it's beyond heartbreaking. I genuinely hope that neither of those people ever walk our streets again. I hope divine intervention occurs and they take their last breaths in prison. And I hope that Alfie Steele's grandfather learns to forgive himself for not knowing, for not being able to protect, and understands that Alfie, in those last moments, cared about him more than anyone else. And I hope that that brings him comfort in the long term. This video is absolutely 100% dedicated to Alfie Steele. Wherever you are now, you're free. Wherever you are now, you're not in pain. And wherever you are now, no one can hurt you. Sleep well, sweetheart. Be safe, guys. Take care.